What's going on, everybody? It's Jacob Soberoff for Y Tuesday coming to you today from Los Angeles, California. And today we are joined by Ed Felton, Professor of Computer Science and Public Affairs at Princeton University. And he's the founding director of Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. He was the lead computer science expert witness for the Department of Justice in the Microsoft antitrust case. He's testified before the Senate Commerce Committee on Digital Television Technology and Regulation and before the House Administration Committee on Electronic Voting. In 2004, Scientific American Magazine named him to its list of 50 worldwide science and technology leaders. So, Ed, thanks a lot again for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. You know, you and your colleagues work with computers all the time. Um, now we're voting on computers more than ever. You know, what, what is the ideal, what does it look like? What's the ideal computer, or what's the ideal voting system? Maybe without computers, with computers, I don't know. Well, I think computers do have something to bring to the table. They, um, a, a computerized interface can be easier to use, it can be clearer, it can be presented with large print or in multiple languages, it can have audio, uh, it can help you catch errors so that if you accidentally vote for two candidates in a race, it can give you a warning box, for example. So all of that is good, but the danger is that, is that computers often get things wrong, they mess up, they crash, um, and, and they don't offer much transparency. The lack of transparency is a particular problem in that you can't really look at the computer and know whether it's doing the right thing. All you can do is trust it to tell you when something goes wrong. Hmm. Um, so um, so there, there is concern uh, about all of this. Computer scientists have, have gotten worried and tried to figure out what we can do to take a computerized voting system and make it more safe. Um, and for me, and I think for a lot of computer scientists, the starting point for making these systems safer is to have some kind of paper record of each ballot, which the voter himself or herself could look at and verify that it says what they want it to say. Uh, and then if there's any kind of a dispute later, that paper record is available um, as part of the record that the county clerk or whoever it is has. Um, and so that link between the voter's intention and something very transparent like a, like a piece of paper whose uh, meaning is very clear is, uh, is, we think, the important safeguard you need. The Secretary of State of California, Deborah Bowen, told me that she thinks that Internet voting, while it would be great for people to be able to vote on their Blackberries as far as convenience is concerned, um, she believes it's 25 years away. Um, but in Estonia, they're using Internet to vote um, now, and it seems like securely. Um, what's your thoughts on that? I, I actually agree more with Secretary Bowen on that question. Um, there's no doubt we can make a voting system on the internet which would let people go to a web page and click buttons to submit their vote, but there's a bunch of serious problems with doing that. One of them is that the computers that we all use for accessing the net are not really all that secure. Um, estimates vary, but somewhere between 10% and 70% of computers have been penetrated by some kind of malicious software that has a continuing presence on, on the computer. Um, spyware or so-called botnet software. Um, and so um, that's certainly cause for concern. If that many of the voting machines, which is what your computer becomes when you vote using it on the internet, um, have been compromised, you worry about that. We also worry about um, issues having to do with the secret ballot. Right, Your ballot is supposed to be secret. That means not only that you um, aren't forced to cast it in, in public, but in fact uh, we traditionally require people to cast their ballot in private. We make them go into a booth that's closed. We don't let them keep a record of how they voted to make sure that they, they aren't coerced in any way. And we don't know how to provide that on the Internet. Uh, the final issue with the Internet is that um, some people have easy access to the Internet. A lot of people do in their house or at their workplace, but some people don't. And for a person who doesn't a have access to a computer at home, maybe has to go to the public library during limited hours to use, uh, to use the Internet, um, they, they, uh, they probably won't have the kind of access to the ballot that, uh, that we would expect. More, if I could turn to a kind of a more recent and in the news issue, you, after the Super Tuesday primary in your home state of New Jersey, you seem to have noticed uh, some discrepancies with, uh, with information that's come out of, of polling places. And it's led to kind of an interesting scenario. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, New Jersey had its presidential primary on February 5th, Super Tuesday. And um, after the election, um, one of the county clerks actually noticed that there was a weird discrepancy on a paper tape that got printed out by one of the voting machines in her, in her county. At the end of the day, when the poll workers closed the polls, the machines print out 
a paper tape that says how many votes for each candidate and um, also how many uh, voters there were in each political party. And, um, and what she noticed was that uh, this was uh, Joanne Rajapi, who is the uh, county clerk of Union County, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. What she noticed is that um, the numbers didn't add up. Um, on one of the tapes, for example, if you add up the number of votes for all the Republican candidates, it comes to 61. And yet the same voting machine that tells you that tells you on the same paper tape that only 60 Republican voters um, showed up that day. Hmm. Uh, so something doesn't add up. And, um, and um, having discovered this problem on one machine, uh, she then went and looked at other machines in her county and found nine machines in the county. And other county clerks went and looked. There's about 60 voting machines in New Jersey that had this weird discrepancy where their machine disagrees with itself about how many Republican versus Democratic voters there were in the primary. Uh, and whenever you see that kind of discrepancy, no matter how small, it's just the kind of thing that shouldn't happen. The one thing that a voting machine ought to be able to do is add a bunch of numbers up and get 61 rather than 60. Uh, so something went wrong, and, uh, and that's the question. What was it, and what's the risk for future elections? And so since then, I saw on your blog uh, some back and forth uh, with Sequoia. Um, what did they tell you to do or not do, basically? Well, so um, after all, after the county clerks discovered all this, they uh, they came to, to to my group at Princeton and asked us if we'd do a study. Uh, they were going to give us access to documentation, to records of the election, to some of the voting machines that had trouble, and they wanted us to look into it and try to figure out, if we could, what the cause was of the problem and what the risk was for the future. And this is the county clerk speaking about the voting machine, right? Yes, that's okay. right. That's right. Yeah, the county clerks came to us. They wanted us to look at the voting machines that had problems in the in the February primary, and they were all ready to give us the voting machines and information um, so that we could do a study and try to figure out what actually happened. But then, um, just before we were going to start, just before we were going to get these voting machines, um, I got an email from Sequoia, the voting machine vendor, and the county clerks apparently got a letter from Sequoia um, telling them that uh, for them to give us this information, for them to give us the, uh, for the county clerks to give us these machines would violate county clerk's confidentiality agreement with Sequoia and would lead to, uh, to lawsuits and so on. Um, and so in the face of all of this, uh, of this, of these legal threats, the county clerks decided uh, to, uh, to back off and, and not go ahead with the study. And uh, so we, we haven't had the chance to look at these machines. Kind of with your hat of a board member of Electronic Frontier Foundation or, you know, yeah. whatever, what, I mean, what do you make of that? Well, I think from a public policy point of view, from a public good point of view, it's a, it's, it's, it's a terrible outcome. Is this kind of, of uh, is this kind of more of a, uh, is this a window into what's going on now with voting machine companies or are some more res responsive than others? Um, or is it generally this kind of thing? Well, you see a lot of this. You see a lot of this kind of secrecy. And um, it's kind of, um, and it's very different from what we've seen in the past with the way votes have been counted. You would think that the counting of the votes and the precise methods, the precise algorithms or computer code that's used for counting the votes would be something that the public has an interest in and ought to be able to see. Um, but most of the voting machine companies take the position that the precise means and methods that they use to count the votes um, should be secret because it's proprietary and developed by them. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of state and county officials have signed contracts that, uh, that seem to give the companies the right to prevent that sort of transparency. Other than um, at freedomtotinker.com on your blog, are there other places people can go to kind of stay involved in, in what you're doing? Um, well, one of the really good sources for uh, electronic voting information is uh, verifiedvoting.org. Um, this is a group that was founded by some computer scientists. And they have information about what's happening on the ground in a lot of different places. If you want to know what technology is going to be used in your polling place, if you want to know what the state of play is in your state uh, moving into the next election, um, that's a good place. Uh, that's a good place to go. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, you know, I, I wanted to say thanks again for coming on Y Tuesday. Um, everybody, if you haven't subscribed already, you can subscribe to our videos by going to ytuesday.org. Um, this is Ed Felton from Princeton University. Thanks very much. My pleasure.